Welcome to the podium. Our encourager this morning, our beloved Reverend John Scott, who is no stranger to all of you. <laughs> Please help me welcome John. Good morning, family. It's a joy for me to add my own words of welcome to you all and um, to just note that there are some people in the audience who are a very special part of my journey. First of all, if the sanctuary looks as if it was decorated for a wedding, it was. And the newlyweds, Mr. and Mrs. Ted Smith, are with us in the audience this morning. Welcome, Ted and Jodie. And there are weddings in the air, so another important family in my life, the, the Marsh and the Wind family are here. Our own Monica Marsh, of course, who is an oldie and goodie in our hearts at the temple. And with her, Valerie uh, um, and her groom-to-be, <laughs> Colleen and her groom-to-be, Ian, and Valerie and a recent groom. <laughs> so welcome, welcome. And Ryan, welcome. Ryan used to be in the Sunday school too. Please stand and let's just welcome you. Okay, Monica, <laughs> you're wonderful. Ah, oh. Valerie mentioned, uh, Valerie, no, uh, Valerie in the on the brain. Um, Carol mentioned uh, the center of the labyrinth. And it was Sandra? Yes, walking to the center. The next time somebody says, you people in Santa of mind at the Temple of Light don't know anything about the Bible. Share this piece of Bible trivia with them. Did you know that Psalm 118, 118 is at the center of the Bible? Hmm. At least the King James Version. There are 594 chapters before Psalm 118 and 594 chapters after Psalm 118. Now listen to this piece of Bible synchronicity or numerology, whatever you want to call it. Add 594 and 594 and you get 1188. And here's the interesting synchronicity. The verse at the very center of the Bible is Psalm 118, verse 8. 1188. Got it? So let me read you that verse from the center of the scriptures. I quote, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And that's man generic, man and woman. When we put God, my friends, at the center of our lives, instead of on the periphery, we find that life flows absolutely effortlessly and joyously so I've titled my encouragement this morning, God at your center. And Sandra didn't know I was going to talk about God at your center when she was talking about the center of the labyrinth. Ernest Holmes, the founder of this great teaching known as the science of mind, wrote, and I quote, in our ignorance, we try to find our center outside the self. This can never be. The ancients said that God's center is everywhere and his circumference nowhere. We are like the upward thrust of a wave. We look about seeing other waves apparently disassociated from us, but underneath is the one ocean pushing all waves upward. And I love that, unquote. Sometimes my affirmation is, Father, you are the ocean and I am the wave. Can we say that together? Father, you are the ocean, and I am the wave. You know, most people, my friends, long for a closer relationship with this God presence that people have, have sought over the centuries. Whatever they conceive it to be, whatever they call it, we long to know this power and this presence and to exercise control over our lives, or at least to know how to respond to the changes that we cannot control. Many people continue to harbor deep-seated feelings that there is something inherently wrong with them, or that God is somehow punishing them for past mistakes. This guilt trip is perhaps more severe for those of us whose religious upbringing emphasized the idea that we are separated from God. 
So when I first came into this teaching, I found the concept of God at my center really a hard concept to grasp. Although I liked the great comfort that I got from Holmes' constant assertion that there is one mind common to all individual men and that it is impossible to be separated from it, unquote. So I thought, wow, I've come to the right place. I am in a place that believes that I cannot be separated from my source. But then I needed to find out what the source was. Impossible to be separated. You ever thought about that? No matter what you do, you cannot be separated. So you might say, Reverend John, how can you say that everybody has an equal opportunity in this one presence and this one power, when so many people seem to have so much, and when others seem to have so little? Jesus the Christ gave us the simple truth, and it is that God is at hand to supply every need. But God cannot force you to take your good. And many of us are there saying, I'm not good enough to, to receive it. So we put our hands behind our backs and say, no, I can't, I've, I'm not good enough. And God is saying, see it here, take it. It's yours. It's all yours. But we have to come to the realization and to wake up to it in a very real way. And God is so good that God can only say yes to what you are believing. So if you believe you're not good enough, what does God say? Yes. Hey, hey, you're not good enough. And gives you the universe then gives you more to prove that you're not good enough. And if you take hold of your, your divine heritage and say, I am good enough. I'm a son or a daughter of the living God. The universe says, yes. hey, hey, that is the truth about you. And gives you more of the good that you are seeking to express. There's a charming legend about the rite of passage into manhood of a Cherokee Indian youth, and it was the practice in his tribe that at age 13, he would have to go into the forest and sit by himself for an entire night with his eyes, with a blindfold on his eyes. He wasn't allowed to call out for help. He wasn't allowed to move. He had to sit through an entire night from, from sundown to sunrise the next day with his blindfold on. And so that is how they marked the rite of passage from childhood to manhood. He couldn't tell other boys of the experience because each lad had to go through this experience on his own. But you know, he sat there the night on this fateful night, and you can imagine the thoughts going through his head, wolves and bears and um, tigers prowling the jungle, he could hear the night noises about him and knew that the beasts of, the, of, of the, the forest were near at hand. And every time the wind blew and the grass rustled, his heart skipped a beat. But he never took off his blindfold because he was determined to be a man. Finally, after an absolutely horrific night, which seemed like an eternity, the sun appeared in the morning. And as the light filtered through his blindfold, he breathed a sigh of relief and removed it from his face. And there beside him was his father. He had sat beside him all night to protect him from whatever dangers might have been lurking. The beautiful Jesus called that God presence he discovered within him, Father, because it sits right with you through thick and thin, through all of your life's vicissitudes, your triumphs, your failures, your, your successes, your ups and your downs. The Father within is there for you. He has your back. Our founding minister, Dr. Elmer Lumsden, often told us that the books of illumined writers or great teachers may tell us of their experience of God, but none of them can give us what we already have, the presence of God at the center of our own being. The only God we can ever know, my friends, is the God within us. And here's the important point. What we know or believe about this infinite presence will govern our relationship with that presence. 
Ernest Holmes writes in a little book he wrote called 365 Science of Mind, and I quote, we must come to realize that God is not in some far off place, but instead that God is an inward, intimate presence closer to us than our very breath. God is not nor can ever be separated from us, but too often we separate ourselves from God. And this, you know, is the wonderful metaphysical message of that wonderful and beautiful story of the prodigal son found in Luke chapter 15. And you all know the story. You know, he, the younger son went off and riotous living, said, give me my inheritance and let me go and enjoy myself. And he did. And the father sat there in silent repose saying, yes, I'll be right here when you come home, if you come home. And he sat there, never judging, never condemning the boy, who went off until he came, into, he came to his senses. And this is what I think is so incredible about the story. It holds a golden moment. The moment when the son says, or the, or the story says, he came to himself. All of us need to come to ourself and to understand our place in the scheme of things as the sons and daughters of something so magnificent, so, so awesome, that just, just to know that it is with us is life transforming. And when that happens to us, my friends, nothing can shake us from that discovery at the center of our being, the presence and power of God. So, you know, when people come to me for counseling, their personal relationships and the way that they tell me they interact with others gives me an important clue as to how they relate to God. For we're always partaking of the nature of God and our relationships with others indicate how joyful or, or dark our relationship with the Almighty is. Let us ref uh, affirm together, and I quote, I am never separate or apart from the infinite. Can we say that? I am never separate or apart from the infinite. I know the presence within is the truth of my being. I know the presence within is the truth of my being. I take time to uncover my inner splendor. I take time to uncover my inner splendor. And I spend time in silent contemplation. And I spend time in silent contemplation of the wonder within. Which brings me to your assignment. Regulars at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living in beautiful Jamaica know that whenever I give an encouragement, I give an assignment. And your assignment this week, should you decide to undertake it, is to spend time every day this week in silent contemplation of the wonder within. The wonder at the center of your being. This is the, the wonder that the angels sang at that first Christmas. Every time you think of God, all of creation joins you in celebrating the birth of something so awesome in your own lives that you could, if you could just grasp it, life would never be the same for you. Many of you know that Reverend Michael Record, sitting in the front, um, and myself go to school every Tuesday. I call it going to school because we have a ministry at the General Penitentiary in Kingston, Jamaica. And every Tuesday, we conduct a program for a, a set of maybe 12, 15, 16 inmates called Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life. And we go with no religious message. We don't, it doesn't have Temple of Light attached to it or Science of Mind. It's purely a workshop, 12 weeks long, one day a week, in which we have these men of various ages, young men and older men, explore that important topic of how they think and what that thinking has done to create the circumstances of their life and how if they don't like the circumstances, they can change them by thinking again. And one of the exercises we do with them is we ask them to, to think about a time when they felt good about themselves. You know, if you're in a, what we call in Jamaica a preke, what do you think about most of the time? The preke that you're in. 
the, the, the poor circumstances that you're in. So we try to get them to focus for a short while on the good things that they may have experienced. So the exercise is think about a time or times when you, fe you felt good about yourself and write down on a piece of paper what quality you were exhibiting at the time that you were feeling good. And we make the link later that those are God qualities, eh? And in this particular class, I don't know if Robert Michael remembers, a young man told this story. His baby mother-to-be, it was their first child, was, ex was expecting his first child. The ultrasound had said it was a daughter. He wanted a young lad, a son. But not to worry, he said, you know, as long as it's healthy and, you know, job bless me with this youth, I'll be happy. Well, one night there was a raging gang war in his neighborhood. And fearing for his sweetheart's life, he put as much of her under the bed as could go, <laughs> determining to cover the rest with his own body as bullets whizzed about outside. And while that was happening, he was trying, in spite of himself, to whisper reassuring words to her. When all of a sudden she said, babes, me weary up myself. And he knew she had gone into labor. Him say, me never know what to do. Me see in the movie say, must boil water, and me saw me boil water. <laughs> you know, I never thought of it. What did they do with boil water when you, 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 you know, you're supposed to be pushing? So. He boiled water, and he delivered that baby himself. Everybody in that class, Reverend Michael and myself, were on the edge of our seats and silence. Nobody could say a word. And when he looked, the Lord had blessed him with a son. He said, God, give me a young lion. And so there is silence, and I'm trying to, to take back control of myself so I don't boil too much water, air water. And I said, so what quality were you exhibiting? And then said, quality? We don't know what quality me was there. Me was a show. But I know, you see, when I hold my youth in my hands, I know how God must feel when he created us. Wow. Wow from a young man incarcerated in one of the most medieval facilities possible. He knew how God must feel. So you know, he said, every youth should have watched him pick them being born and there'll be no more violence against women. Wow. We are now observing a period of, I think it's 16 days of Nonviolence towards women. You know, maybe we should be celebrating or observing a whole year of respect for the womb of creation for our womankind. Wouldn't that be wonderful? If we could just make the shift from against violence to deep respect and honor for the cradle of creation. And you know, that baby, that baby that he held in his arms with water boiled that he didn't know what to do with. <laughs> I thought every baby born is like that baby Jesus. That's the story told over and over and over and over all across the world. Every time a child is born, all of creation, all of creation sings a carol and a song of praise that there is the coming of something so precious so beautiful and so profound. And to think that our women have the blessing and the privilege and the assignment to nurture those young lives, to bring them into being and to, to watch them grow in grace and in truth. Boy, is a young lion, God give me, Jabi praised. And so friends, by the simple act of returning to center. That's where I want you to go this week. Spend time just returning to that place of silence and beauty and stillness. 
which is the stable of your own heart, the manger of your own consciousness, and there nurture that Christ child, which changed the whole course of human history. God loves you, and so do I. Namaste.